this is uh, the first of two lectures that we're going to do about legal malpractice. Um, we don't really have a lot of mod model rules about legal malpractice apart from 1.8H, um, but the MPRE examiners say that they test it. Um, your best guess for preparing legal rules about malpractice is to do at least a once read through or skim read of the restatement of the law governing lawyers because there's a number of sections that cover malpractice liability and the duty of care and causation and things like that. And so um, if that would, uh, the MPRE examiners say that they can test you on the restatement sections and part of what I'm gonna share in, in these next two lectures is going to be based on that and other guidance that's been put out by the ABA. Overall though, keep in mind that this, is, these, this topic is a little different than the rest of the course because we're not talking about rule violations necessarily, we're talking about torts um, typically. And so let's go um, and take a look at uh, the slides that we have for this topic. Um, this is Legal Malpractice Part 1. Just a quick recap, uh, we did have a Rule 1.8H, which is a, one of the conflicts of interest rules, that says a lawyer shall not make an agreement prospectively limiting the lawyer's liability to a client for malpractice unless the client is independently represented in making the agreement. In other words, you cannot ask up front most of the time for waivers of liability, like um, uh, in other areas where we might ask for a waiver of tort liability. And two, you can't offer to, you can't settle a claim or a potential claim um, for such liability with an unrepresented client or former client unless that person is advised in writing of the desirability of seeking and is given a reasonable opportunity to seek the advice of independent legal counsel in connection therewith. Now I have a whole other video just about this rule. I don't wanna spend time on it. I just wanted to remind you that we don't allow waive, malpractice waivers upfront most of, in most situations. And we also don't allow you to on your own settle malpractice actions unless you have at least advised the client in writing that they um, really should talk to another lawyer. Now, um, so our, some of our slides are going, just going to be sort of points here from the restatement. Legal malpractice refers to an attorney's civil liability to a client or other injured person for professional misconduct or negligence. These differ from disciplinary actions. And so a malpractice, legal malpractice action is in civil court. This is litigation. Um, it's a complaint or a lawsuit against you. Disciplinary hearings typically aren't, right? They're an administrative proceeding, typically. Now, in some states like Texas, the lawyer can opt for a jury trial in a disciplinary matter. But the, the default rule that you should assume in most places is that when you are being considered for a grievance and they might are thinking about reprimanding you or suspending your license, it's going to be before a panel or a tribunal from the state bar. Um, the attorney's adversary is in a malpractice action is the injured party, right? And usually your former client, um, as opposed to the disciplinary authority. And the purpose is to obtain compensation um, for the injured party, not to punish the attorney or protect the public um, from your uh, misconduct. Malpractice actions can come under a number of different theories. You can have lawyers sued for intentional torts like misuse of funds and fraud or abuse of process or misrepresentation. Um, there are, uh, and it depends, this depends a little bit on the jurisdiction, breach of fiduciary duty actions against a lawyer. So lawyers um, have fiduciary duties to their clients and a lot of lawyers assume fiduciary roles on boards of directors or as uh, trustees of a trust um, and, um, and or as the executive drafting wills and so forth. Uh, breach of contract, express or implied, so you contracted to do someone's legal work and then you didn't, um, or you, uh, you agreed to keep quiet about something and you didn't. And then intentional tort, uh, or unintentional tort, sorry, but this is the ordinary negligence and this is by far the most common for legal malpractice actions. And so now remember from your first year torts class that a, norm, a negligence action involves, we can break it down into elements in theory of a duty of care, breach of that duty, causation and damages. 
And that means that if you're going to sue a lawyer for legal malpractice, you're going to have to show, uh, put on evidence of what the duty, uh, there's the standard of care is for lawyers in your jurisdiction in this type of matter. You're going to have to prove that your lawyer breached that duty. You're going to have to prove your damages and prove that the lawyer's breach is what caused those damages. This means that you, you may have committed malpractice and if we can't prove, let's say, causation or there's no damages, there's no prevailing in this cause. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's talk about the duty of care for a moment. You owe a duty of care to a client. Now, what's the client? This may sound um, super easy. That's who you agreed to represent. Uh, wait, uh, not so fast. A client may include a person that simply asks the attorney for legal help if the attorney does not decline to give the help and if the attorney knows or should know the person would reasonably rely on the attorney to give the help. And so there's lots of cases out there where someone goes into a lawyer's office for a consultation and the attorney says something like, okay, well, we'll look into it and get back to you. And that's a, a, an evasive answer. The attorney decided not to take the case, but never told the person that they weren't taking their case. And and the person took that because their people are prone to wishful thinking um, to mean that the lawyer was working on their case and we get back to them when he had solved it or she had solved it. And so we're, this is going to be a fact intensive case by case scenario um, inquiry about whether this non lawyer layperson or uh, client um, or prospective non client, let's say, uh, reasonably thought that you were going to represent them. And this can also happen through people uh, getting your legal advice online. You run into someone at a social event and they say, can I ask you a legal question? And you start advising them. If they rely on what you said, you can find yourself sued later on for malpractice and you don't even remember the conversation. And so remember that prospective clients, or um, you can have a prospective client who you didn't agree to represent, but you sort of somehow invited reliance by under a reasonableness standard on their part. Um, and, uh, and that can trigger malpractice liability. Also, sometimes you can have like beneficiaries of a will or the beneficiary of a trust, and you are in breach of a fiduciary duty and um, uh, to that person, even though they weren't the client. What's our standard of care? Well, for our general practitioner, it's the skill and knowledge ordinarily possessed by attorneys under similar circumstances. If you purport to be a specialist or an expert, um, or you act in a, very, in a law that, uh, area of law that's super specialized, like international corporate taxation or mergers and acquisitions or something like that, um, then the attorney has to exercise the skill and knowledge possessed by attorneys who practice that specialty. The relevant geographic area is your jurisdiction and usually the state. Lawyers in rural areas are going to be held to the same standard as the lawyers in the capital city. What counts as a breach? Not a mere error in judgment. So you just made a judgment call and it turned out in hindsight that it was the wrong call. If it's a mere error in judgment, that's usually not a, a um, grounds for malpractice liability. Lawyers also will not be liable when acting in good faith on the honest belief that your advice and acts are well-founded and in the best interest of the client. And, but it will apply in areas where you simply fail to know settled principles of law. So if this is a, let's say a client comes to you and this is a case of first impression in your jurisdiction or, and there's a circuit split otherwise, and, or there's a lot of uncertainty in this area of law, right? There, there are certain areas of law that I teach like uh, federal preemption of state statutes in, in statutory interpretation and administrative law, where it seems like every Supreme Court case contradicts the one before it. So there's a lot of uncertainty in which makes the cases unpredictable. And you, um, you putting your bets on the wrong outcome, as long as you explain to the client, like this is not a sure thing, but let's try it or something like that. I think this will work. That's a mere error of judgment. On the other hand, the fact that you like don't even know you can't do that, that, that's, that you're trying to do something and that's not a thing in the law, that is on you. And your client should ha expect you, has a right to expect you to be knowledgeable. Um, I want to say something else. Uh, because you have to prove causation and damages, this creates a kind of a weird um, procedural uh, feature of legal malpractice actions. And I made a little slide diagram. I hope you like it. 
um, um, uh, and we call it a trial within a trial. And this isn't the area, only area of law where we have this problem. But with legal malpractice actions, if especially if the malpractice relates to a, a litigation, like you were, you're a litigator, now you're being sued for malpractice. So less common with transactional work. Um, then what happens is we have to kind of redo a, a mini version or a quick, uh, a quick um, overview version, quick and dirty version of the, the prior litigation, put on all the evidence and stuff in order to show that they would have won, but for your incompetence. And so this ends up like with sort of redoing the trial um, in a streamlined way in your malpractice trial so that the fact finder, whether it's a judge or jury, can can see either that the same result would have happened, the client would have would have lost their case anyways, even if you hadn't commit hadn't made a mistake, or um, from the plaintiff's standpoint that they would have won and how big they would have won, but for but for the lawyer's negligence. And so this ends up with, you just watch for this in the legal literature and when you're talking to practitioners, when we have legal malpractice actions, there's this unusual fe procedural feature that can be very confusing where you're kind of doing the trial, redoing a trial within a new trial. And then um, causation. What do we mean by causation? And this is hopefully a review from your first year torts class. And with actual causation, we have two types of concepts in the law. One is but for causation. This is, and sometimes I, I, you could think of this as something philosophers love. This is um, proof that the injury would not have happened but for the defendant's negligent act. And so um, now, as you probably know, this is a complicated problem because there's lots of um, I, everything that happens in, in the universe is in, in some ways a but for of a whole bunch of different things that all worked together for the bad, right? In, in this particular unhappy instance where we have malpractice. And so, um, I, I mean, let's talk about but for causation for just a moment. Um, you know, if you have a the lawyer that commits malpractice, we could say, well, I mean, but for that that guy's law school not graduating him, um, but for his parents not giving birth to him, maybe that uh, we wouldn't be in this situation, right? We could take but for causation all the way back to Adam and Eve every time in everything that goes wrong in the world, and so, um, uh, the, so so that is a problem that we'll get to in a moment. Then we have the substantial factor type of causation. And I want you to think about this. I know you had examples in your tort class where, and this is where several acts unite to cause an injury and any one of them alone would have been sufficient to cause it, but that negates but for causation. And here's the like classic, there's two classic tort scenarios. One is you have two negligent arsonists, like two people that are starting leaf fires or burning garbage um, in, in their yard at opposite ends of the street. And both of these morons set um, their, their house and neighborhood on fire. And, and the plaintiff's house is in the middle between the two arsonists, uh, right? So, um, it, and the fires meet in the middle. And the problem with saying, but you, you, you'll lose on but for causation in that, in that situation, because you can't say, but for you starting your fire, my house wouldn't have burned down. Because the fact is somebody else had started a fire that was going to burn your house down too. And we would leave people without remedy. And so what the courts do is basically say it's substantial factor. You're both liable, right? And, um, or your torts uh, example in your, your torts casebook may have been um, the two hunters, right? Who simultaneously shoot at um, what they think is a deer moving through the woods in the distance. And it's actually a third hunter, right? So you have a hunter who simultaneously gets shot by two other hunters, um, mistakenly, who are being negligent. And again, it, we, we don't want it to defeat his claim against them for negligence that either one could say, well, you were going to get shot anyways. Um, and, and so there's no but for causation. And we, so we have this legal doctrine called substantial factor causation. Proximate cause is where you prove that um, it's fair to hold this defendant liable for unexpected injuries. Um, uh, or for unexpected injuries that happen in unexpected ways. In other words, uh, to talk about uh, taking causation all the way back past to past generations, you know, um, 
that if only this hadn't happened, if only the state of Texas hadn't been found, um, then we wouldn't be here and this tort wouldn't have happened and so forth. And, um, and so at some point we have to draw a line, right? We're not going to take every lawsuit back to Adam and Eve or, or, or Noah's Ark or something like that. So we, we draw a line and we say, this is close enough. And we have a number of factors for arguing where to draw that line. And Latin for close enough is proximate cause, right? And so, um, and this is going to be how foreseeable it was, how many intervening factors there were, um, the amount of time that's elapsed and, and so forth, where we can make an argument uh, there. But I want you to recognize with, Proximate causation, there's a little bit of arbitrary line drawing. Okay, we have different types of damages, direct damages, right? This is, and often this is your the fees um, that your client paid you for nothing, and um, or um, the, their losses, their out-of-pocket losses um, that they, they wouldn't have had to pay. Then we have consequential damages, and these are losses that flow indirectly but very foreseeably from your negligence, right? So we could have a situation like um, the person's business uh, closes because you didn't renew their license, their liquor license or something like that. So the restaurant closes and now we have lost wages and uh, other, law, other litigation. They have to cancel the contracts with other vendors and so forth. And so imagine you... Do you commit malpractice and something that your client was counting on you for kind of blows up and then it sets off this sort of domino effect. And sometimes those can be included in your damages. Okay, that ends our first lecture, the first part of our lecture about legal malpractice actions. And we'll continue with 